Welcome, and thank you for joining the American Journal of Bioethics webinar. Our topic today is post-row implications for health professionals. I'm your host and moderator, Dr. Alyssa Burgart, a digital media editor at bioethicstoday.org. The decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health case overturned Roe v. Wade, reversing a constitutional right to abortion and abandoning 50 years of the right to privacy and bodily autonomy. American access to abortion and other essential reproductive services was already inadequate prior to the Dobbs decision, but this decision has already dramatically worsened access, with some states banning nearly all access to legal abortion care. Health professionals are faced with navigating this rapidly shifting legal landscape, not just for reproductive care, but also for broader medical treatments. Our panelists today bring wide ranging expertise in reproductive justice issues and professional practice areas, including midwifery, nursing, and pediatrics. Stephanie Tillman is a midwife, writer, and activist in Chicago. After almost 10 years in clinical practice, she is now a PhD student in the healthcare ethics at St. Louis University, focusing on consent in intimate exams through lenses of queer theory and feminist ethics. Stephanie's teaching and advocacy in abortion care includes leadership on the boards, pardon me, boards of directors of the Midwest Access Project, the Nurses for Sexual and Reproductive Health, chairing the American College of Nurse Midwives Ethics Committee, and as an advisory committee member of the Queer and Transgender Midwives Association. Dr. Monica McElmore is a tenured professor of Child, Family, and Population Health Department at the University of Washington School of Nursing. She retired from clinical work in 2019, however, continues at currently provides flu and COVID-19 vaccines. Her research is focused on reproductive justice. Her peer-reviewed articles, op-eds, and commentaries have been cited in five amicus briefs to the Supreme Court of the United States and three National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine reports. She is a recipient of numerous awards and currently serves as the chair of Sexual and Reproductive Health Section of the American Public Health Association, and she became editor-in-chief of Health Equity in 2022. Dr. Naomi Laventhal is a neo neonatologist and pediatric bioethicist at the University of Michigan C.S. Mott Children's Hospital. She cares for infants in the Brandon Newborn Intensive Care Unit and provides prenatal consultation and perinatal care coordination for expectant families in the Von Voigtlander Women's Hospital. Her scholarly focus is on perinatal counseling and decision-making for infants born extremely prematurely or affected by complicated obstetric and fetal conditions, with a secondary focus on neonatal and pediatric research ethics. She serves as a faculty ethicist in the Program on Clinical Ethics at the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences and Medicine. I'd like to thank Ms. Tillman, Dr. McElmore, and Dr. Laventhal for joining us today to share their extensive expertise in this topic. Monica, I'd like to start with you. I know how important words uh, words are to you and that the specific words that health professionals use matter so deeply. Can you help ground us in terms of the kind of inclusive and accurate language that we should be using when we talk about reproductive health? First of all, um, thank you very much for having me. And uh, it's such an honor to be here with my co-panelists. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, to be clear, I use she and her pronouns and using Monica is totally appropriate. Thank you very much for having us. First, uh, when we first announced this webinar, you know, we talked about uh, health professions, you know, for medical professionals. And I, I my immediate reaction was, oh, my God, no, because I don't work in medicine, right? I'm a nurse. And so I think using inclusive language around health professions, when we know that there's going to be differences in disciplines, is super important for a couple of reasons. Um, similarly, when we think about the language that we're going to use today, reproductive health, reproductive rights, reproductive justice. Um, those concepts are all different, right? So reproductive health is like clinical health services provision. And so when we, when we talk about reproductive health, we're talking about you know, uh, pelvic exams, pap smears, we're talking about physiologic birth. When we're talking about reproductive rights, we are talking about the legal protections that allow us to optimize and provide reproductive health services. So it, it, conflating those terms always is it's like you know nails on a chalkboard for me. 
reproductive justice is a completely different way of thinking about all of this. And quite frankly, it is a, a theory, a praxis, a uh, organizing strategy to really talk about how do we get beyond reproductive oppression and really move towards you know, an, a place where bodily autonomy and people optimizing their right to become a parent, to not become a parent, and to parent the children that they have in safe and healthy environments is part of the national lexicon and, and the language that we use in an a orientation frame. That said, I do want to say one other thing. In, during this discussion, we're, I know we're talking about abortion. I know we're talking about you know, reproductive health trajectory. But I, I also want to be very clear that I will use the term you know, as much gender inclusive language as I can. But because I sit on the board of Black Mamas Matter Alliance, we use the words mama and maternal purposively with a hat tip towards appreciating that it's an inclusive term of, of birthing persons. And, and we've talked about this across the Black diaspora of including cis, trans, non-binary, queer, uh, gender non-conforming individuals in, in all of the work that we do. And so part of it is a historical response to, to previous tragedies in language that we've used. And so I look forward to this discussion to really be able to engage about this in, in deep and meaningful ways. So thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Stephanie and Naomi, do you have anything to add to that in terms of, of language and using these terms? Well, one thing I would just say, I really appreciate that framework. It's really helpful to me to hear about that from you, Monica, is that I think it's important to give ourselves and each other grace as we look for the right terms to use in this rapidly changing world that we live in. And, you know, I will try very hard today and I bet I'll get it wrong at some point over the over the next hour. And I think I think sort of recognizing efforts and intention and giving ourselves space to make mistakes is really important when we talk about this. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that um, when we talk about abortion rights as a queer rights issue, as a trans rights issue, as a non-binary rights issue, as a reproductive rights issue, it very, it's very helpful, not only for us as panelists, but everyone who's listening to understand that that's how we're setting the stage. We are talking about anyone who can get pregnant, anyone who chooses to continue that pregnancy or not, and the implications of what is going on right now for all of those people. So I'm really grateful that we've, we've set that. Excellent. Thank you. You know, Stephanie, I'd love to start our next question um, really talking about the practice of midwifery because, you know, midwives provided abortion care before the medicalization of pregnancy for forever, right? Um, and long before the criminalization of abortion that took place in the mid 1800s and, and a physician crusade really against not only abortion, but also against midwifery. Um, you're a midwife, you're in Chicago, you're studying for your PhD in healthcare ethics, really getting into the, the deep meaning of your relationship between midwifery as well as with uh, reproductive autonomy. In this work, um, how is it that your role as a midwife really informs your thoughts on, on abortion in this conversation? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. You know, midwifery, just to even take a couple steps back, uh, the identity of midwifery is a pretty tragic and problematic history. The way that it started is um, that Black uh, midwives, Indigenous healers took care of their communities uninterrupted, very well expertise with deep benches of knowledge in doing that. And when white medicine institutionalized itself, there was a very intentional practice to strip those Indigenous healers and Black midwives of their knowledge, of their authority, of their specialty. And it was then used against those people's bodies as white medicine then began practicing what it was trying to learn um, without um, appreciating uh, the work that had been done for so long before. I think then too, because midwifery, as it started to come back into the fold, very often through the route of nursing, which was then for so long subordinate to physicians, subordinate to medicine, midwifery has had this very long path of re-radicalizing itself back to the roots of where it started. And we still, as a field, really struggle with the whiteness, the white supremacy within our profession, um, the racialization of a lot of the care that's provided that in some ways comes from medicine, but in other ways comes from our own history of how white nurses and white midwives did not invite midwives of color and healers of color back into our profession. So within our own work, we've been sort of on this continuous upward motion of re- 
addressing um, the the racist roots of how midwifery was taken away um, from communities and how it hasn't been brought back as well as it could be. And so in that way, medicine has taken what was a sexual and reproductive health care, a pelvic health care profession, and turned it into a gender-based oppression and turned it into a race-based oppression. And abortion, of course, is wrapped up in all of that. So us trying to bring back abortion care, not only as a normal part of healthcare, is also a way of trying to reclaim the language of the work that we do, to reclaim how normal it is for pregnancy. As Monica brought up, physiologic birth, trying to bring that back is radical because we have to undo so much of what came before. Very similarly, to normalize abortion and talk about how abortion is easy, it's common, it's safe, there's quality care to do it, and also you can self-manage it up until a certain point is radical when it shouldn't be. It's such a normal thing for so many people in so many communities that instead it ends up being this scholarship effort or this advocacy effort to overcome things that have come before, which is really part of the trick. So it's become both a sex and gender and race-based oppression um, to think about not only what's happened to midwifery, but also nursing, advanced practice nursing, and our specialties within pelvic health care, whether that relates to birth or whether it relates to um, abortion care. The other thing that's been um, part of that is how um, the, the argument that I and others try and make is that midwifery is very uniquely poised to do abortion care. The framework of midwifery is to meet people where they are. And I think that um, the way that a lot of politics talk about abortion, the way sometimes that medicine talks about abortion is very much a claiming and a power um a, a power trip over what people are allowed to do, um, what resources we will give to people or what information we gatekeep from people. And midwifery has a really unique opportunity to say, we always meet people where they are, whether that's in home birth, community birth, hospital birth. We talk about shared decision-making and I have my own feelings about shared decision-making, but it is a way to try and work to equalize power, whether that happens or not is um, up for debate. But to say, how do we do that? And I think a lot of community organizers and a lot of individual folks who get pregnant, who then self-manage their abortion, it's a really striking example for medicine to say, oh, people are self-managing something that's been in healthcare for so long, when for midwifery and for any community organizing for queer care that has for so long been outside of institutionalized healthcare, that's normal to a lot of us. Um, so self-managed abortion and midwifery support of that, midwifery support of abortion care anywhere that works for people um, is a really beautiful place for us to start. So um, whether that's through through thinking about how midwifery is coming at it or thinking about how midwifery can really promote what's happening. Um, that's sort of where the, the midwife in me rests with abortion care right now. Fantastic. Stephanie, thank you so much for giving not only that historical context, but also the way that that works in terms of your practice and, and, and really what the future of midwifery can bring, can bring to this conversation. Um, Monica, I'd love to, to move into your role. You're an incredibly strong advocate, not just for reproductive justice, but also for the profession of nursing. Um, and that's one of the things I've really appreciated about hearing about your work related to both of those things and the beautiful intersection that those have. Um, and you've written about this intersection. And one of the things you've said is that, you know, part of what brings healthcare workers to provide not only abortions, but a, but a wide spectrum of reproductive health services is because of our moral beliefs, not in spite of them. Can you address kind of how this Dobbs decision has really impacted the core of what it means to be a nurse? Absolutely. I mean, uh, first of all, I think it's really, really important that we remember that nursing is, you know, people come into hospitals and healthcare institutions for nursing care, right? I mean, we are the, you know, most represented profession and we are in the hospital 24 hours a day, right? If you wanted to see your physician, you would go to your physician's office, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think about the essentials of nursing care, one of the things that I always try to explain to people is it is a life of service. 
it is a profession of service, right? So, I mean, the example I, I generally like to give people when I talk about nurses and abortion care and whether or not you want to provide care and how your personal, you know, feelings intersect with your professional responsibility is, you know, we historically have always had in our country a situation and a circumstance where, you know, we provide care to people. I know we're going to get to MTALA later on in this, but, you know, when gunshot wound victims and perpetrators of violence come into our institutions, we're not judge and jury there. We know that people are to be cared for, to be stabilized, and that is the, the responsibility of some other entity, regardless of how we think about gun violence, right? And so it's really fascinating to me when we think about the bodily autonomy of abortion, of reproductive health care, of whatever, that we want to be able to prejudge individuals and what care we will or will not provide in a life of service to the public. Like to me, that people make decisions, they make choices, they do all sorts of things that we may or may not ethically and or morally agree with. And yet we still take an oath to care for the public. I, I take that very seriously. And so when we think about people cherry picking the kind of patients that they want to be able to take care of and or not, I just find that to be highly offensive, not just as a nurse, but as a human being. Because when we committed to a life of service, we didn't say, oh, only if you behave appropriately or only if you live a risk-free life, which is impossible, or <laughs> under these conditions and circumstances. Like I, I, that, I am extremely frustrated by that. And I, I place a lot of that at the feet of nursing faculty because I am one. If we are teaching nursing students that they have the opportunity to decide which patients they want to cherry pick and take care of and, and not, then we've lost our way in terms of what our role is in society. So for me, I take it very, I have taken care of all sorts of people who do all sorts of things that I would never personally sanction in my own life, right? It's irrelevant because nursing as a profession is a, a, a you know, an orientation about the sanctity of the existential decisions that human beings get to make as sentient beings. So for me, it, it, it we, we get gummed up when we're having too many discussions about what is aligned with abortion, what isn't, because that's not the conversation we actually should be having. And I have been saying for a long time that quite frankly, that's intellectually lazy, right? I think that for us, Either we care for patients and we've taken our oath seriously in addition to our licensure and our legal responsibility, or we get to interject our personal feelings against our professional ethics around what we will and won't do as a licensed member of the health professions. That's the conversation that we really need to have. Now, should people be able to allow, you know, to conscientiously object and to not, not morally have to engage with things around there? That's a discussion we need to have. But to fundamentally say that patients who need abortion and abortion-related care are a just a swath of individuals that you can write off. Um, and and the last point on this, because I, I want to make sure we have time for discussion, but here's the other thing. My research has shown that this is way messier, way more complicated, right? More people are in the middle and, and we've used these shortcuts. We've allowed that to just say, like, like, to think that abortion care is a light switch off or on. Actually, no, it's a dimmer because there's a whole continuum around where people will and won't be able to you know, provide care, will and won't be able to meet people. And some of that's informed by their personal experiences in addition to their professional ones. Some of that's informed by their fear and lack of educational exposure. So they don't even know how to translate their skill set. Right. So it's it's complicated. And I'm I'm appreciative that we can have a discussion that gets at that nuance and that complex. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Monica. And that really, uh, really resonates with me as a as a physician, because whenever we're having these discussions around, you know, whether we see it in trauma care or COVID care or reproductive health care, it's the same thing. We have gotten into this for a life of service in which we can serve and care for human beings who appear in need of our excellent skills and being able to provide those. And I agree, having that conversation, what a critical opportunity uh, to make sure that we don't miss. Thank you. Naomi, I'd love to get your perspective now. So you're a neonatologist. You're in this very unique position to really foresee the impact 
that these abortion bans will have on pediatrics and specifically related to infants who have severe congenital conditions or might be born extremely premature. Um, how is it that this alters the landscape of what you expect medical practice to be like for pediatricians? Um, it, that's such a big question. And, and, and I think it's so, it's so interesting for me to come to this as a pediatrician and hear Stephanie and Monica describe this perspective that's so different from my daily work. Um, so to frame this a little bit in terms of what I do. Um, so my day job is in, is in an ICU doc, so also in the hospital 24 hours a day. And you could really ask, what does that have to do with abortion care at all? You know, these are these are all patients who have been born already are in my ICU. And I also have this interesting role where for all of the joy that I get to witness taking care of infants, um, I also interact with a lot of families on their worst days. And I think that, you know, one of the sort of cocktail party things that happens to me a lot when I tell people that I'm a neonatologist is, wow, I hope I never need you, right? And that's an, that's an interesting place to sit in that, um, and that I meet these families, and I think it's it's easy for pediatricians to think that their odyssey started the day their baby got admitted to the NICU, but that's not when their odyssey started, and that's not when their story started. Um, and I sort of built this niche expertise when I came to my institution around working with families before they'd even delivered and before they'd even had um had had these children and decided how they wanted that to go. And it's been so humbling, I think, to live in this plurality of of patients who really want very different things as they approach their um, their their pregnancies and their births. And, and one thing that I think we need to be really careful about when we talk about the outcomes to, to sort of get to your question, Alyssa, is that um, this, this idea that every baby that's in the NICU was born to a family that chose to continue that pregnancy that pregnancy and in a sort of assertive way and intended to take this, this, um, this baby to term and come to the NICU. I mean, unfortunately, I, you know, you described this early on, Alyssa, I take care of a lot of families where access to the full spectrum of reproductive health care was already lost to them, you know, either due to legal constraints around when they got the information they got, what their insurance would pay for, where they lived. There are so many things I think that have already happened to these patients by the time they come to us. And some people are in the NICU with really sick children when with other options, they might've made different decisions. Um, and so most of the time in my work as a pediatric bioethicist, I work in spaces trying to work with clinicians trying to accept the, th the, the reality that some families want interventions for their children that we wish they didn't want. And that we look at the prognosis for these conditions and we say, gosh, if you knew what I knew, if you understood what I know, you might not want me to do all of these things. And I spent a lot of my career trying to help people step away from that posture and, and be more open and understanding to the, the, the parental experience. But now suddenly I'm facing something very different, which is sort of having children born under my care um, with parents who were denied access to something that they might have had before. Um, and it's so hard to, from where we are now to know what that's going to look like for us. I think it's so hard to imagine within the constraints of all the data that we don't have, you know, what is this going to look like numerically? What is this, what, how is this going to affect the choices people make? Um, it is almost impossible to know with any accuracy how many pregnant families decide to terminate their pregnancies before they ever come through my door or have spontaneous losses before they ever come through my door. So getting a numerical estimate on how many more babies with this condition are going to be born alive, it's it's almost impossible to do that yet. That's what everybody wants from us, right? Like put a number on this and I can't put a number on this. And the other thing is I think that we can't assume that every family that doesn't have access to an abortion then will prefer comfort care or non-life prolonging care for the baby after birth. I think we're going to encounter families who might have made a different decision when, you know, had they had access, but once they've delivered and they have a live baby, they want something very different. And we're going to have to cope with a lot of cognitive dissonance about that. So I think we're going to see an impact on the profession. Um, I think we're going to see a kind of reproductive loss that we haven't seen before. You know, I think a lot about the many kinds of reproductive loss. It's not, it, it's not just a miscarriage or a stillbirth or the death of an infant. It's loss of the potential. It's loss of the life you thought you were going to have as a parent. And I think the complicated grief and guilt that we're going to see from parents who have to sort of live with, I would have had an abortion, but I couldn't. I think that's going to be really complicated for our patients. Um, and so 
I think this is going to challenge my profession. It's hard to imagine that it won't challenge our resources, but it's hard to put a number on that. And the one other thing, when I step back and stop being a neonatologist and think of myself as a pediatrician, I think this isn't only an issue for the pregnant patient and the baby that's born. I think this is an issue for the family that already had other kids. And one of the positions that the American Academy of Pediatrics has that I really appreciate and respect is that it's in all children's best interests for their parents to be able to decide how many children they're going to have. And, you know, I think we're going to see a whole other kind of strain as families sort of are challenged to take care of more children and and or travel out of state to get procedures that they can't get in their home state. I think this is going to have rippling effects on child health way beyond the discrete impact of the prematurity or the congenital anomaly. Thank you so much for bringing that really holistic perspective from uh, neonatology and pediatrics perspective. And I think you brought up so many issues that have really concerned me in my role as a clinical ethicist in a, in a center that has both a labor and delivery center and a, a large pediatric population. And, and I'm definitely feeling those, those issues as well. Um, can Monica, I jump in here real quick though? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I need to say this because I think it's super important. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much uh, for your work, Naomi. I am a NICU graduate. I say this to people all the time. I was a preemie in 1969, right? I was eight weeks early. Like I shouldn't be alive, but I am. I'm very grateful for that. That said though, we really need to think about not just the constellation of the pregnant person in their family. It's also our staff. Right. I, I know we are like midwife and physician and like researcher and nurse and all this other stuff. But the staff, it's not, it's it's even the complexity of the staff. When we interviewed NICU nurses to, to to when I did a whole study of trying to map a continuum between conscientious objection and conscientious provision of abortion care with nurses, the next group of nurses I interviewed were NICU nurses. And it was so interesting to see the amount of conflict. Their conflict was different. But their conflict, it wasn't about abortion care versus not. It's like, why are we keeping these babies alive? And like, oh my goodness, look at the long-term deficits and the impacts. And the, like, they're wrestling with a whole set of other pieces that I don't think we're also prepared to be able to support our currently strained and strapped and disrespected workforce. Um, so I, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that as team-based care folks, both you know on the sort of prenatal and the postpartum and the NICU side, this will have intergenerational impacts for our workforce, across, regardless of where you work in the health professions, because everybody's wrestling with this, right? And everybody's in different places around, like, okay, it, whether it's their own personal abortion or their own personal birth story or trying to get pregnant, like, we have no space right now in healthcare for us to talk about the intersection between our personal lived experiences that are going on in real time along with the people that we're trying to support. And so I, I really appreciate what you said, Naomi, because I, I actually think it's it's going to have an even broader impact when we bring in the rest of the team and all of the pieces that sort of go along with that as well. And that we need institutional support to be able to discuss these things. And I, and I would push us to do like oncology has done in the past, because that's where my training is from. We need Schwartz Center rounds. We need to make sure that we have these these purposive and intentional spaces to be able to talk about this as a team. Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think it really gets to the, the immense moral injury that so many of us in healthcare have faced from so many different directions, especially in the past uh, several years. And so I think that in watching the Dobbs decision come down in a context of a workforce that is already facing immense, immense moral injury, immense moral distress. How do we move to a place of resilience in which we're able to provide the service, the excellence, the meaning making that comes from being a provider of other human beings? And how do we do that effectively? I really appreciate that you brought in that, that perspective. Um, Monica, I'd love for us to just switch gears at this point and, and talk a little bit more. And we talked about using the term maternal mortality specifically. Um, compared to other, you know, high income, you know, developed countries, however it is we choose to, to reference that, the, the U.S. simply has an incredibly high rate of maternal mortality. And with so many additional people potentially forced to continue pregnancies that they may have made other decisions regarding. 
what, you know, I really expect that we're going to see increased risk for pregnancy associated and pregnancy related death and disability. When you think about in the context of your role as, as a nurse, as an advocate, how does that, how do you think about that issue? Um, I'm going to follow uh, Stephanie's lead, and I'm going to put a link in the in the chat. Um, the Black Women Policy uh, Blueprint Team, uh, led by Dr. Jamila Taylor, who's a colleague, collaborator, and friend of mine, put out uh, some talking points. Uh, it's a four-page PDF document. I will put a link in the chat. She's uh, currently at the Century Foundation. Uh, brought together some of the, the deep thinkers in reproductive justice in clinical abortion care provision to talk about this link between Black maternal health. Um, and for the listeners who don't know this, the CDC has estimated that Black women are three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy and, and childbirth-related complications. There's a whole talking point piece that, they, that we've put together um, to really address these issues. So much of what I'm going to say, I got to give credit to the people who developed this, right? Because I, I help, but I didn't do it. It is very important to understand a couple of different things. The first is, is that in the states where we see the most restrictive policies to abortion, we also see other um, disingenuous lack of supports for pregnant capable people, like uh, they are contiguous with the states that did not expand Medicaid under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. They're contiguous with the states that have the highest rates of not only maternal morbidity and mortality, but infant mortality. They are states that also have restrictive policies around our social safety net, whether it's you know benefits in terms of being a low-income individual around Medicaid and what they can and cannot do, all the way to having you know no paid family leave, no no maternity leave, no employer sponsored health insurance, like. So let's be very clear that the restrictions on abortion are going to further exacerbate what we already call health inequities in those those states and those locations. The second talking point is this, the people who have births and the people who have uh, abortions are not different patients, right? They're not different populations of individuals. They are the same people at different time points in their lives, right? And we already know from multiple studies, whether it's the Turnaway study and, and or the incredible analysis that Dr. Amanda Stevens and her team have done, that Black Indigenous people are bearing the burden and the brunt of these poor outcomes. And so if we really say we care about public health and if we say we're really serious about policy, you know, decisions that will improve health outcomes and reduce health inequities. I'm very curious to turn around this conversation discussion and how are we going to engage around people who are forced to birth, forced to carry pregnancies to term? And how are we going to rethink our, not only national statistics that we collect, but then how are we thinking about intermediary measures that will include patients' experiences of their care when we already know that mistreatment during pregnancy-related care and the episode of birth is rampant, that we know that our healthcare you know, facilities in and of themselves, the structures are inhumane. They don't work for the patients or work for us as providers. So how are we going to think about reimagining that? And how are we going to be thinking about in this landscape where people are traveling for abortion? I mean, the idea of injury prenatal care early, that we should, we should be talking about throwing that out the window right? Because we're going to have people who are forced to birth where their intention never was to birth. And now all of a sudden they're going to be penalized in our statistics because they're going to be late entry to prenatal care, right? These are the kinds of discussion that we need to be talking about in terms of, yes, we are in a brand new landscape. So what are the new data needs that we have? How are we supporting and backing up the maternal morbidity and mortality review committees that are already underfunded, oversubscribed. There's a brand new report out from Black Mamas Matter Alliance around the nine regions of the country and where we've invited members of the public to participate in those committees and, and they've left feeling disrespected, not listened to, not heard. So there's a lot of work that we need to be doing right now to think about the intersection between the loss of abortion access and the relationship that that will have to maternal morbidity and mortality. And, and really thinking about, okay, so how can we get creative around this period? And I want the listeners to understand that the fall of Roe is temporary, right? Because we existed in the country when Roe didn't exist, right? So I, I want us to be thinking very, very differently around what we can be doing to mitigate harm and or take a harm reduction approach 
but then also be planning for a future where we actually could achieve reproductive justice. Absolutely. Stephanie, on this point, you know, when you look into the statistics around American maternal mortality, evidence really points to the fact that a major issue, not the only issue by any stretch, is that we don't have enough pregnancy care providers, especially midwives, especially when you compare that to communities that have a much better ratio of midwives to pregnant persons. So how do you expect the loss of abortion of abortion to further impact midwifery practice? Yeah. Um, first of all, I was just um, scrolling through the attendee list and I just want to give like a workforce shout out to the nurses who are on here and to the abortion providers who are on here and the abortion clinic owners who are on here. Um, there has been a workforce issue for a long time. So whether that is an access issue from the patient side where people have extreme distance from being able to access any sort of a provider, whether that's family medicine, who full scope family medicine absolutely does sexual and reproductive health care, whether that's midwives who also provide primary care, depending on their location, whether that's people on Indian Health Service land, whether that's people working in federally qualified health centers, there has been a workforce issue for a long time, and we are only being stretched more and more, whether that's because we are still in a incredible pandemic that we are all figuring out. The clinical workforce is stretched to the max. We have a monkeypox public health emergency that's happening right now. And now we have people, as Naomi was saying, uh, who are forced to have children that they wouldn't have otherwise chosen to have or do not have the circumstances to be able to support or to parent or to um, live in a reasonable way with those children. The workforce issue has been extreme for a very long time. It now is even more extreme because so many states had laws that the moment that Dobbs was released, an entire clinic staff was out of work. Many clinics were then out of work. Entire nursing workforces were out of work. And then you have people who are either in hospital systems or in larger community or um, clinic systems that still have a job, but now have a job where they are um, silenced in their workplace, where they cannot practice to their full scope. And that has been the case for a long time, depending on someone's provider type that they cannot practice to their full scope, it's even more extreme now. That has also been the case, even um, what we know about evidence-based, safe, quality abortion care. We know how to do that care. There's a lot of research to show how to do that. Even before Dobbs was released, there were millions of restrictions on how people could actually do that care. Providers were told that they had to read a certain script about what abortion would cause, such as things like cancer or mental health diagnoses, which we know are not true. Providers were told they had to say blatant lies. People were forced to view ultrasounds that they would never have viewed otherwise. People had state mandated pelvic exams because that was a requirement for their abortion procedure. People had to wait days or receive parental consent or go through a judicial bypass system to be able to receive care. So even if we think about, sure, people are living in areas where their distance to care is an issue. It's so much more than that. The complexities of the system that actually have been preventing people from getting care for a long time that are now even more extreme um, because of these limitations. It really is a mental gymnastics game at this point for people to find what they're allowed to get care for, where they can get it, and for providers every day who have to read new laws or new policies to figure out what care they're allowed to provide. And just to um, jump on to what Monica was just saying, in these same states where we have these very quick anti-abortion trigger laws or we have um, these progressive anti-abortion laws coming into place, these are the same states where you can't even say the word gay anymore or teachers can't talk about being gay or they can't. Um, help their students stay closeted if that's what the safest thing is for them. So similar to all of the racist policies that are coming into play, all of the um, limitations on public support, public aid, these are happening against the queer community also. And blatant safety concerns um, beyond just healthcare provision and extension of people's ability to access services, um, but also people's just ability to live fully as themselves and disclose themselves fully uh, to their 
providers, whether that is being able to disclose their pregnancy or able to disclose their sexual or gender identity. Now we have limitations on what patients can even tell us and be able to tell us in a safe way. I also think that for midwifery, there has been so much innovation during this time. Um, midwifery owned clinics for a long time have been a unique thing within healthcare. And it's happening more and more where midwives are opening full scope sexual and reproductive health clinics like Memphis Choices. Midwives are opening um, abortion clinics like Partners in Abortion Care in Maryland. Um, there are midwife led uh, faculty practices that are uh, very much focusing on full scope um, from abortion to birth care like at the University of Washington. Um, there are really interesting and fascinating innovations that are underway right now. And people are really stepping up to work together collaboratively. I think that, you know, in Illinois, um, we're a safety state. So many things have been happening around our state and people are flooding in to Illinois to get abortion care. The estimation was our capacity before Dobbs what the capacity would be now is an increase of 9,000%. And our wait times are so much higher than they used to be. People who would be able to access a medication abortion based on their gestation can no longer do so by the time they can get to Illinois. So they're forced into a procedure or something more invasive that they would not have chosen for themselves. Um, and really the what that does to the workforce um, is stretches us even further than we've already been stretched and really puts the pressure on training as many providers as we can as quickly as possible. And particularly what's been a pretty restricted scope of practice for advanced practice clinicians, physician assistants, and midwives to be able to do abortion care, definitely um, the physician community is understanding with the capacity needs, we need everyone to be able to practice to their full scope. It's not an addition of our care to be able to do that. It's within our scope and removing those restrictions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stephanie. You, you brought up so many critically important issues there. And I think that um, one of the ones that's been unavoidable that you that you made is this, this very clear connection between racism, extensive white supremacy, anti-LGBTQ uh, legislation, behavior, violence, and violence and uh, anti-decision-making against people who become pregnant, birthing people, individuals who are making reproductive health choices uh, that we're talking about here. And it has been incredibly concerning as, as a healthcare provider to say, is it safe for me to travel to some of these places? For my colleagues who are abortion care providers, it's no longer clear if they can safely travel, for example, or, or accept employment, for example, in states that are simply hostile towards they, their existence and their ability to provide any treatments. I wonder if any of you have uh, comments in particular on that. Let me take this one to start. I mean, the, the travel piece, I think, is really tricky because the travel is actually a retrofit. People have been traveling. Right. So let's let's not act like, you know, folks have incredible access. Now everybody's going to travel. Right. People have been traveling. And my good colleague, uh, Dr. Ushma Apadiyai at Answer, Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, has documented this along with Rachel, Rachel K. Jones and the Guttmacher Institute. People have been traveling. And so it, but it's an interesting conversation, at least on the legal landscape, this notion that somehow interstate commerce and people, we, we're trying, not only are we telling people that they have to maintain pregnancies that they don't want to maintain, but now we're telling you where you can and can't go, right? So it's a bigger, again, I always try to get people to understand abortion is very effective at getting people into their feelings, very similar when you call somebody racist, but it's not actually getting at the fundamental issue. And the fundamental issue in terms of when we think about, you know, people trying to travel and the expected, you know, volume of individuals, there was a question in the chat around, you know, we, Black maternal mortality in California is already high. How are we supposed to anticipate, you know, working on this with people traveling in from out of state? The truth of the matter is that's actually not the right questions to Naomi's point. Trying to quantify these things is not actually helpful. What we really need to be doing is we need to be documenting the harm reduction approaches as we move forward. What is working? What? How can we help support mutual aid? What are the abortion funds doing? Like, how are we thinking about this? Not necessarily so much just to document harm, but there are innovations that we are missing. 
I also want to make explicit something that Stephanie said that I uh, completely agree with, which is, you know, patients can be their own abortion providers. That's why self-managed is so important. We, we've been talking around this, but I've seen it in the chat as well. There's, there's a really sort of patriarchal gatekeeping kind of thing we have going on around pregnant capable people that we're not talking about. And that is patients can be their own abortion providers, and yet the law treats them like criminals. If you look at the case that's going on in Alabama, if you look at the case that's going on in, you know, Nebraska, we are treating pregnant people who technically under the law still have bodily autonomy in life and death, right? Nobody can go dig up your organs once you die without your consent, right? So we are, we are missing the bigger picture by purposefully polarizing people into these camps of, oh, well, I'm pro-life and I'm pro-abortion or I'm anti-abortion that for those of us who are not only bioethicists and those of us who think deeply about these issues, we have to curate different kinds of conversation. And part of that is disrupting these binaries. It's not helpful. And so when we start to really think about this traveling across state, it is a bigger discussion of, are we really prepared as a society to tell people where they can and can't go? And, and, and for what reason? That is a, that it to me it, again it ties together the attacks of uh, of our democracy it ties together the attacks of you know gender affirming care it ties together what you can and can't teach in a classroom so there are these these different discussions that I think we also need to have in terms of it's not just about traveling across state lines or who's a haven state or who's a hostile state it's more as a country we are making a determination that we will continue to reinforce that that your health or lack thereof is contingent upon your zip code, right? Not your genetic code, not your, like, we are we are prepared to say that where you live, and, and we've been documenting this for years, right? The people who have been behind social determinants of health and health equity have said that your zip code should not determine your health outcomes. And yet that's exactly what we're doing here. But abortion exceptionalism does not allow us to make that link that we're saying, oh, well, you lucky if you live in that state and uh, yo, too bad if you live in this, one. right? Why can't we tie our larger discussions to broader discussions about place-based excellence in healthcare and health services provision? Well, and Monica, I think that's such an important point is that I, I doubt that those of us who are on this uh, webinar would argue, I think all of us want to be having those deeper discussions that talk about the real issues that are going on here. And that, that the issue of abortion exceptionalism has been very purposefully curated to prevent those conversations from happening. And how uh, the work of dismantling that approach is the foundational work of those of us who want to be able to provide dignity-based care to other human beings in all sorts of ways. Absolutely. Um, Naomi, you know, my, my next question was originally going to be about the, the decisions that you help families make when you have a pregnant patient who's, who's looking for your advice. And, and we talked a little earlier about the different decisions that different patients may make based on their circumstances when that decision is actually available. Given that at this time, fewer decisions may be available to certain patients because they're legally limited from having access. How do you foresee that influencing the kind of comprehensive counseling that you would normally provide to somebody who's facing a serious diagnosis during pregnancy? Well, I'll say that the part of my counseling work where I describe to families what's not going to be available to them, the choices they won't be able to make, is something that I already do. And it's the hardest, hardest sort of most uncomfortable aspect of the counseling. So this comes up frequently in the landscape of extremely premature birth, right? Where in, you know, there's a range of um, um, gestational ages at which we offer parents wide authority about what they want to do if they deliver a live born baby. Um, we might advise differently and, you know, across that age, but there is unfortunately a sort of arbitrary line in the sand about it um, related to, you know, strict belief in gestational age, which is flawed from the beginning, right? I mean, you know, we make decisions based on you are 25 and zero, as if we know that that patient is 25 and zero. And I worry about that a lot. But I do spend, I, I have had to learn the skill of describing to parents, you know, 
here's where your ability to make a decision about this is going to end. And here's what that's going to look like. And I think that I'm going to have to do that in a whole other way about conditions where I haven't had to do that before. So if we think about, for example, uh, patients who choose to have terminations with a fetal diagnosis of, of Down syndrome, I think that that this is going to be a great example of where that's been something that some families choose to do. Many families choose to carry those those um, pregnancies to term, and the range of outcomes for children with Down syndrome is really broad, right? But you can imagine situations in which parents might have wanted to have a termination and now have a live born, potentially term baby with Down syndrome who, I mean, one scenario of that is that I have to force care. The other scenario is that there's no care for me to force because that baby doesn't need anything from me. Um, and so I think that... That's going to be a complicated moral space, but I think we're going to do everyone if a disservice if we describe that as a tragedy, right? And I think that, I mean, I have many, many worries about this, but I think that we need to be open enough our, in our thinking that there are going to be some families who might have had a termination who then find joy in raising a child that they had anyway. And it's this is not only going to be tragedy. Um, I do envision some scenarios in which, which parents' choices are constrained by having been sort of forced to continue to a live birth. Um, and I can think of a spectrum of conditions where, where parents had the full authority to decide what they didn't think was a good life for their baby before birth and are gonna have less authority to de decide that afterwards. And one thing that I wanna, I think is helpful to me when I talk to a broad range of audiences about this is when I counsel people about pursuing it, you know, I don't do a lot of pre-termination counseling, but I do sometimes get asked to weigh in with families where they're trying to say, what is this like? Because hearing about what this is like is going to help me decide what I want to do. That is, that is something that I do. Um, and that the decision to have a termination, the decision to deliver a baby with a serious condition or extreme prematurity and have a comfort focused approach where we don't pursue life prolonging intervention and the decision to say, I want everything that you have to offer me. I think all of those are parenting decisions. And it's really important for us to remember that. And that, you know, when I think about Lisa Harris's work about this has been so important to me in understanding that, that people who have even really early abortions that doesn't mean they don't view themselves as parents. And that doesn't mean they don't view that as a baby. And so sometimes I worry about this really obsessive use of the word fetus. I'm like, it's okay for people to talk about this as a baby. That's how the family wants to talk about it. Um, and so I think recognizing that spectrum of parenting decisions as we think about this is really important. But also recognizing that until pretty recently, the story of extremely preterm birth and the story of life with severe congenital anomalies and, and genetic disorders was told by people who had a kind of life at all cost approach, right? And was told by survivors, right? We we told the stories of the of the children who came through the NICU and lived, and we heard about we heard about those stories. And now we've made a little more room to talk about people who choose comfort care from birth and that sort of odyssey and that experience of, of carrying a pregnancy to term, knowing that your baby will die in the newborn period. I think we're, we've made more room for that. Um, I don't think there's been any space for people to really talk openly about what it was like to have a termination in the face of those of those um, diagnoses. And so, you know, when I think about this question of, of how's the landscape gonna be changed by, by, by forced pregnancy, we just have to be incredibly broad in our thinking and, and really, really consider the full spectrum of what parents decide to do and how they experience it. I, I really, really appreciate that. As, as you know, I take care of critically ill infants um, as an anesthesiologist and also as a bioethicist. And, and having watched uh, families go through that process, both in the, uh, you know, before reaching labor and delivery, as well as for families who are in the NICU, it's such a powerful and incredible time. And one of the things that I hear in that beautiful commentary that you just provided is this language that we've heard from each of our panelists, which this is, is this idea of who are the gatekeepers, not only of the treatment that we are allowed to obtain, but the conversations that we are allowed to have. And how is it that those of us in the health professions, how can we help to dismantle that gatekeeping in order to have a, a really full understanding of the goals and values of the folks that come to us looking for that care, looking for that dignity response. Um, so I really, really appreciate that. 
I wish we had hours and hours and hours to talk because I feel that this team of amazing experts could just keep going and keep dropping knowledge, but we have four minutes left. So I am going to take the next question to Stephanie and then we'll have final comments. You all have so many amazing questions in the Q&A and we have been furiously chatting that we will reach out to you all in an alternative method after this uh, engagement. We are really excited to get to those questions. Um, we wish it could be during this live period. Um, so Stephanie, I want to pivot to something that we had talked about previously, which was this kind of this issue of conscientious objection. And, and Monica spoke so eloquently about the the really the the breadth of what that means and how it's not really one thing. Something we've seen in the news, and we certainly know from our patients' experiences, is that there have, for example, been when we talk about gatekeeping, pharmacists, for example, who have despite a patient receiving a legal prescription to obtain, whether it's uh, basic contraception, emergency contraception, other medications, when we see folks in other gatekeeping positions like pharmacists refusing to fill those, how does, as a, as a midwife, as someone who's trying to provide holistic reproductive services, you know, how is it that you think that we should be helping patients navigate access to, to effective contraception and emergency contraception? Yeah, I think first, um, just to continue a little bit of the conscientious objection, conscientious provision conversation that Monica brought up, you know, I'm newer to ethics. I've done a fellowship. I've had one year of my PhD, but still very new. So I come from a lot of this from the clinician side. And what I have come to learn in these brief intros to ethics that I've had is most people are doing conscientious objection wrong. A lot of people think they get to say, no, I object, and they get to walk away. And that is not the ethics of conscientious objection. If someone truly has a reason that they will not engage with something, they are required to disclose that to their employer, to their coworkers. And if someone needs that thing that they've declined to participate in, they need to immediately find that care for someone. So people are not doing it correctly. And particularly when it comes up in the media, it's only sort of recycled as this is how you get to throw your hands up and not participate in this care. So what's going on in pharmacies right now is an ethical violation of the utmost degree that people are misengaging in this idea of conscientious objection directly to people's harm. And similarly, like this, Monica brought up harm reduction. Absolutely. I think that we need to be thinking about what other harm reduction strategies we should be doing, whether that's in pregnancy testing and thinking about pregnancy testing similar to urine drug testing. And the fact that the outcome of that urine test that we take, that someone does not necessarily know that we've taken from them, what the criminal outcomes of that test can look like. It behooves us now to start thinking about pregnancy testing like urine drug testing, which so many providers never think about the fact that actually you legally have to consent someone for a urine drug test. Instead, it's included as part of a prenatal panel. It's included as part of opt-out drug testing or opt-out testing generally on admission to labor and birth floors. Um, and really, if someone didn't consent to that test, you don't get to run it. And so those results don't get to be weaponized against them. And pregnancy testing needs to now be added to that roll call of things that we are starting to question for ourselves. I think too, in terms of contraception, and in terms of getting people to the care that they need to do in sort of a parallel universe, a lot of the work I do is around trauma-informed care and trauma-informed um, intimate exams. Part of a trauma-informed care system is referrals and referring someone to another location where you know that they are going to get similar care that you gave to them or better, <laughs> ideally better, we're constantly referring up. Um, but if we write a prescription and we don't know as clinicians that we're sending someone to a pharmacy or we're sending someone to a next location where they may be discriminated against, they may be openly judged, publicly shamed, which has been happening across pharmacies, then we have not done our job. And again, this workforce issue is insurmountable at this point, um, as is the patient experience. Um, so really trying to think how we're getting people into this care. And then the final piece too, that again, sort of bucks the trend of healthcare and the industrial complex of medicine and nursing is abortion 
fits in very easily with a mutual aid model. And it is very uncomfortable for healthcare to think about communities taking care of communities and people, your neighbor helping to take care of you. And the idea that like, okay, we can get you contraception a state over, like, don't worry about going to um, the pharmacy that's going to judge you. Like, we'll figure out how to get your contraception to you. And the National Network of Abortion Funds if you are not familiar with their website, if you are not familiar with their work, there is no need to step in and offer new methods of how people can access abortion care, access contraceptive, full scope sexual and reproductive health care. Tap into your local mutual aid fund, your local abortion fund to find what those systems are. So people shouldn't feel like, um, whether that's providers or patients, that they're stuck trying to fix a broken system when actually we know through uh, work to abolish uh, systems like these that we know are broken, that we can rebuild something better. And mutual aid for abortion has been going on for a long time. And really, we should just be tapping into those. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I mean, what I'm hearing again and again throughout this conversation is really taking our agency as health professionals in our variety of disciplines and using our skills to help break down those barriers to ensure our patients get access to what they need. And I know that all of you know that, but I want to make sure I said it again and again. Um, I would love to give each of you an opportunity to make a final statement as we bring this incredible webinar to a close. Um, Naomi, do you mind if I go to you? Sure. And I, you know, I was prepared for this question and really thought about what is the last thing that I want to say about this. And I think with regard to my role on this panel as a neonatologist, I want us all to not fall into the trap of assuming that we know what it's going to look like for every patient who is unable to have an abortion and goes on to have a live baby in the NICU. I think that could go any number of ways. I think families are going to be really different in what's important to them and what they want. And if we box these families into one pathway, we're going to do ourselves and them a big disservice. Thank you. Monica, your final word. Uh, Bell Hooks taught us to center the margins, which means that the people who are closest to a problem have the best solutions. And so I think we need to listen to abortion storytellers and people who have had abortions. We need to listen to abortion providers and, and those who, who provide this care to really appreciate and understand what we need to be doing in this moment. And this is temporary and we can make this all different. Thank you. And Stephanie, your final word. Um, I'm going to offer two. The first is most people who have abortions have a medication abortion. Everyone should know the protocol, the medications, and the side effects of a normal medication abortion. There are very rare risks to that. Any of us know people who have medication abortions. We'll see them in our care. We'll talk to them. It is very important right now to know the basics of abortion care, and all of those resources are readily available online to understand how medication abortion works and what it looks like and how to keep people safe if they've had a medication abortion and are, and are seen for care. The second Second is that common rhetoric, whether it's in ethics or in clinical practice, is that abortion is siloed. It is, as Monica said, an exceptionalized version of care. And we are here to tell you that is not the case. There is a thriving, vibrant community of abortion providers, abortion advocates, abortion scholars. We love this work and we talk about it all the time. And if you are waiting for an invitation to come out as someone who supports abortion, to to get involved in abortion care or advocacy, consider this it. We want you. Um, patients need you. Providers need you. So please join us. There, there's no official invitation. This is it. We really would love um, for everyone to come out in support of abortion because otherwise the rhetoric is very loud against it. Um, and now is not the time to let that be the case. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Well, if there was ever such an engraved invitation, I think that's it. So for everyone in our audience, please listen to Stephanie Tillman. This is your invitation. We look forward to having you expand your, your knowledge, your education, and being able to expand your ability to help support patients in any of their experiences. This has been such an incredible conversation. I'm so grateful to our panelists who were here and who, who volunteered their time to share their exceptional and deep knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us at the American Journal of Bioethics webinar, Post-Implications 
of, uh, pardon me, post row implications for health professionals. If you haven't already checked out our issue for this month, everything is free. All the content is absolutely free for three months. The entire issue is dedicated to this issue related to abortion and many, many perspectives related to its impacts uh, re regarding this decision. Please check it out, download, read it at your leisure. There's so much for all of us to learn and for us to share together. Thank you all so much. Thank you for joining us.